that if they can grow when I'm not there, that means I can borrow their brain. And when I come back, I can learn the wisdom they integrated. And it's like you have multiple brains trying to solve the problem of jujitsu rather than just yours. And I don't know about you guys, but I am way too limited to approach jujitsu by myself. And I found that if I have a team who was all aspiring to aim up together, it was a much more accessible path. And it was a path that I wasn't pushed down. I was pulled by my love for the art, by my curiosity and by the people around me. Love that. Love that. Love the humility and love the mindset of we're going to do this together and tap into everybody else. And yeah, just lever almost like leverage, right? You're leveraging everybody else around you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wanted to know personally for me, and then we'll, we'll dive into some questions. Um, uh, as a coach, you know, sometimes I'll ask students, whether it's online or in person, hey, what are your goals? And it's kind of a weird question to ask in jujitsu. It's not like lifting weights. Mm -hmm. I want to lose 20 pounds. I want six pack abs or, you know, I want to put on muscle. It's, it's a little bit more subjective, it seems. And you had mentioned uh, finding that you know, finding that thing, that deeper thing. And so I feel mm -hmm. like a lot of times when I've asked students, Hey, what are your goals? It's, it's not super clear cut. And then a lot of times I'll ask them, why do you want it? And it's still like, mm, you know, so a lot of times I'll, I'll try to dig deeper and, and get to the underlying motivation, but how can one uh, find that within themselves or what are some practical steps? If, um, you know, somebody's not super clear on what they want, uh, how can we find first find what they want? And then you know, dig deeper, like you said, to really find that thing that pulls us? Yeah, good, good questions today. So I think we should address the starting point where we all stand that for the most part, I think we're all probably deeply confused. We're not transparent to ourselves. We, we don't really understand what drives us. And the thing that has fascinated me, like I just went through this couple year study of the hero's journey and how meaning plays a part in that. And you don't get to choose what you find meaningful. And like, if you really think about that, right? Like the most sincere and energy filled aspects of your experience have nothing to do with the sense of I choosing them. And I think there's a lot to be revealed in there. Like we talked earlier about Carl Jung's idea of circumambulation that, you know, your life is following this arc that's getting closer and closer to this eventual thing. Well, that thing that what you could be if you achieved your potential and became what you could say what it is you're destined to be, right? That, that is something that exists in the future as an ideal, but it exists right now and it reveals itself through the experience of meaning. So I think the best thing we can do is learn to get really quiet, right? develop some sort of mindfulness practice where we can get out of the chaos of our minds and kind of get down a little bit into our heart and then pay attention to what we find meaningful. And, and meaning can be experienced as a loss of a sensation of time, a loss of a sensation of self, the rate of perceived exertion, something incredibly difficult now feels very easy because it's aligned with your path. But whatever is meaningful for you, that's what's gonna pull you forward. And the thing is you don't get to choose what's meaningful for you. So I think a lot of our work is not so much creating a plan, but it's almost like there's a prescription written on your heart and it's your job to uncover what that prescription is and then have the courage to walk that path. So we can't construct meaning, at least I don't think we can, right? It's just my, my ramblings on it. I don't think we can but I think you can learn to observe meaning in your life. And in the context of goals relative to jujitsu, pay attention to the aspects of jujitsu, which you find deeply meaningful, which you are pulled toward, because that is an environment that is going to call forth aspects of yourself, which currently exist in potential that in the future will hopefully exist in reality. And that's how jujitsu will be a unique vehicle for your own development because it's going to take each of us. There's, I don't know, 15 people here. It's going to take each of us in very different directions. But the point is that it takes you in the direction that you're supposed to go, which is why we all have very different stories relative to jujitsu. But there's a, a uniformity in all of our stories that there's an aspect of jujitsu or multiple aspects that speaks to your soul, to your depths. And if you can figure out what that is and pursue that and align your goals with that, then you probably get the most out of the art. Wow. 
Fire. So much good stuff. Um, I know we've been in about 15 minutes. I know how it is on a Zoom call sometimes where there's there's not a lot of engagement and you know people fall asleep. So I want to I want to just jump in right now real quick, shake things up. I want uh, if you guys don't mind just sharing one or two takeaways because that was a lot already. That was deep. Sharing one or two takeaways, and then I wanted to go to Steve because I know Steve has a, a, a question that kind of pertains to what you're sharing about, Chris, with uh, mindset and meditation. But um, anybody mind sharing one or two takeaways they just got so far? Yeah, sure, I'll go. Thanks, Joe. Um, so this is Joe. Uh, so I liked like kind of your uh, your quote that you were saying about that any motivation that's based on push instead of pull will not last long term. And I think that's kind of like a interesting quote because it's from the way I took it from that was that basically anything that's not like your own doing, it's not something that you're motivated to do, you're going to kind of burn out. So if you have like ulterior motives, as far as like you were saying that when you first started, it was to kind of like defend yourself. But then once you realize you're able to defend yourself, you didn't have any more, if you would have stuck with that one, then you wouldn't have had any more uh, motives basically. So you had to come up with new ones. And I think that's a cool, um, like setting your own like short-term goals. I think that's like a cool mindset. Um, and then kind of, as you develop in jujitsu and life that you're changing those goals and motives to kind of match and reflect where you're currently at in life. So I thought that was pretty cool. Awesome. Dude, that's great. Yeah. It's that, uh, remember that Heraclitus idea, like a man cannot step in the same river twice because he's a different man and the river is a different river, but like, that's what jujitsu is for all of us. Like I've been training for 15 ish years, 14 years. And jujitsu is very different today than it was 14 years ago. Like it's baseball and football, right? It's the same art, but my relationship to it has changed entirely because I've changed. And I think in all of our own journeys and your own unfolding process, where we are using jujitsu as like a yoga, a form of that unfolding, whatever role it plays in your life right now, that's the exact role it's supposed to play. And then maybe you just offer yourself the invitation of am I ready for this to play a different role, you know, and see what bubbles up to the surface. So I would say, even if we're using it purely from an egoic standpoint of reinforcing an identity that maybe may not serve us long-term, maybe you need to do that now. Maybe you need to misuse jujitsu first before you can properly use it later. So I think bringing a little bit of acceptance to it where whatever our relationship is to it, that's great. That's cool. But maybe we can just bring a little bit more mindfulness to it. Ask some appropriate questions. And maybe in that environment, we create a space where our relationship to jujitsu can more mirror the needs of our soul rather than some initial goal that might not be clearly thought out. Really good. Really good. Um, Randy, do you mind sharing? I know you had put in the chat a uh, uh, great perspective. Uh, just curious yeah. what you got out of that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's kind of like adding on what Joe said. It's that, uh, what um, what I got was that community within a community kind of you know, something that I'm doing right now, and I didn't realize it <laughs> until you said it. Yeah. It is true because these guys I train with uh, in the morning. I mean, I, at first it was more of like selfishness, like you said. It's like, yeah, I just want to get better. But no, we need each other. So within the gym, within the gym, you have these group of guys that you know we all pull for each other. And uh, I just didn't realize that. I'm like, uh, so that was like an aha moment to, for me. It's, um, it's not just me. It's a, you know, you're, it's a team that you're pulling against, uh, you're pulling together. Um, but yeah, that was a great perspective. I, I, that was an aha moment for me. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, Randy. Um, we're going to go to some questions real quick. Uh, Steve, I know you asked about mindset yesterday on our call. Uh, wanted to open up the floor to you. Go for it. Sure. Uh, um, and I, I just want to share it, Chris. I just bought your book, so it's going to be here on Saturday. Excited for it to arrive and kind of dig in uh, a little bit. I wanted to um, also share with the group that you now I a, a big one of the biggest takeaways so far is really that concept of pull versus push and how Chris is explaining that to me. It's, it's been really hard to push some of those goals and some of those activities, um, especially after nine years. Um, training in jiu-jitsu off and on injuries, you know, life, et cetera. And sometimes it's hard to get back to what we really started as in terms of um, our goals for jiu-jitsu. I love that concept of re-engaging and realignment to your pole. And what is it now? Why, why is it different now? Why do I want to train now? 
And I completely aligned to at first when I started jujitsu being a smaller guy and um, and being um, able to and, and having trained in the martial arts all my life, got into this, completely got demolished my first day. And I was I don't know about you guys, but I was pissed off. I was like, hey, I don't never want this to ever happen to me again. Never want to be in a situation where I felt felt hopeless and not knowing what to do, even after about. 20 years of martial arts training, I, I felt like, you know, out of my element. So that was really my push to learn jujitsu. But now, nine years later, having a family, having a life, having a career, having friends in this environment, that continues to pull me to jujitsu. Uh, after Blue Belt, I think all of us can agree, after Blue Belt, you, you're pretty much equipped with the tools to handle yourself in a self-defense situation. But now it's really about why do we train? And wanting to get better and not really, you know, the belt, I think the belt ramp doesn't really relate as much anymore. I think it's just really about the concept is how do I get better each day? So Chris, I guess my question and mindset is we, a lot of us tend to get into that plateau where we feel like we're not getting better every day. How, what are your, some of your advices and, and, and what is some of your tools for us to kind of get over that plateau plateau and, and really recognize, yeah, we are getting better just in a, maybe in a different way. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, so I think it's best to address that through understanding what a plateau is and how a plateau would form. So I'm very big on the relationship between the environment and the organism. And I believe the environment grows the organism. So whatever you want to become, you figure out what environment would create that. So when it comes to a plateau, I think what that is, it's a feedback from your environment that you are no longer meeting the necessary resistance to facilitate your growth. And there's this idea of the zone of proximal development where you have just enough resistance and challenge to stretch you, but just enough competence where you're able to successfully walk that path. And when we stop progressing, we're either trying those crazy Instagram flying moves that make no sense that are way beyond our pay grade and probably not even worthwhile, or you're doing the same scissor sweep you've done a thousand times over and over and over. So whenever anyone comes to me about plateaus, it's actually a very easy fix. I, for lack of a better term, it's be a more sincere student. It's okay. Where, because we all know that jujitsu is like infinite and guys like I've, I am mildly competent at jujitsu, but I am well aware that I have gaping holes everywhere in my game. I mean, very simply, whatever guard you love to play, try playing it on your other hip. And now all of a sudden you're like two belt degrees lower than you were on your right hip than left hip. So we have an endless amount of opportunities to get in that zone of proximal development where we are appropriately stretched. And if we're not, it's either later in the game, it's like, intellectual laziness where you're just not asking the right questions to pursue it. In the beginning, you may not know what that is. So then I would just say, okay, if you are at a plateau, do something you're not good at until you're good at it. And as we get more experience and we learn and grow, you'll start to recognize that I think every training session is like a scientific experiment, right? Like remember like in grade school, we learned the steps of the scientific method and no one cared. I didn't care, right? But that's literally what you do in jujitsu. You, you posit a, a theory. It's like, I'm going to try out this technique. I think it's going to work. And then you try it out on your partner. You run the experiment. You fail horribly. They give you that data. You then have the opportunity to integrate that data. Okay, I have more information. So now I'm going to restructure that goal a little bit. So you make goal 2.0 and you try a different way of doing that technique at a different time with a different off balance. And on a long enough timeline, you eventually solve the experiment where you figure out the technique that works in the right possible way. So for me, it's like every training session is I'm stepping into the environment. I need this environment to force me to grow. So if I'm training and I'm not experiencing difficulty, it means I'm doing the things I'm already good at. And I need to try something else. I need to run more experiments. Uh, and then the flip side would be if I'm training and everything is impossible, it's going way too hard. I need to take two steps back and go back to the basics. So good. Really good. I'm, I got a page full of notes over here already. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to Garrett next. Garrett had a, had a question. So Garrett, go for it. 
Hey, hey guys. Hey, Chris. Um, love everything you're saying. I think I'll be picking up that book today. Um, I just, I really, I really can relate to this push and pull thing that you're talking about. I hate to stick on the first thing you said, but it's so good. It's so good. Um, you know, what pushes everybody in there is different. Um, but I think it all comes from the same place. Uh, it's kind of like what we feel the world is constructed around us and what we should live up to, you know, and, and, you know, come in there and am I, am I supposed to be a tough guy? Am I supposed to be this, this technical wizard? that I see, you know, Mikey Musumichi and all these guys who just, you know, it just comes out of their brain so easy. And it doesn't feel like that for most of us for many, many years. And so, so having that push and I think I, I just a little background on me. I came from a really rough school where there were a lot of big guys and I'm just big enough. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm just big enough where you don't feel bad beating me up and, <laughs> And so all of them would get, you know, I got grounded on for years. And so the push of, of not wanting to be bullied, not wanting to have somebody be able to do whatever they wanted with me actually carried me a lot longer than it probably should have. And through that, I actually developed a bunch of bad habits. I was kind of a, a bully on the mat. I was an anti get bullied. So I was bullying. You know, I was, I was a lot more pressure than you needed to have. I was you know, sitting in uncomfortable positions, just kind of chilling there. And, uh, but once I got past that, once kind of proficiency catches up to that, to that fear push, I feel like I can't that then I, I felt that pull of mastery, you know, of trying to, to have the correct answer for every question that was asked of me on the mats. And through that, I've kind of, I've kind of taken that into my own life where, you know, it's not about always being the, the gnarliest dude who's able to do everything. Sometimes it's about having the right answer from myself for whatever question is coming at me, you know, because my answer is going to be different than yours. So I, I just really, I, man, that push pull just kind of got me. I'm going to, I'm going to do a deep dive on that because it's, it, it made me look in for a second okay. and, and, you know, you see, you see what pushed you and you see what pulled you. Yeah. And I'm sure everybody else here is probably thinking the same thing. What, what pushed them and what pulled them? Dude, I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, that's worth diving a little bit deeper into. So we should really be careful of the words we use to talk about these things, right? Like words are a very poor medium to describe all of you in your depths, but it's the only vehicle we have, right? So we do our best, but words are very revealing when we say things like should or ought to, like there's so many preconceived judgments. And I, I, I'm talking purely from a personal perspective. Like I was so freaking hard on myself for the first like 10 years of training. Like I, by default, I'm a pretty happy guy. Like I'm pretty much on a zero to 10. I'm rocking a nine and a half all the time. Right. I read enough stoicism books where I'm always just right there. I, I don't come off that. But if my guard got passed in training, I would be at a two until the next time I could train again. Because I have developed a relationship with stress where I think that I need it in order to achieve because my whole life, I've just allowed myself to experience this little bit of tension that I bring with me all the time that I think is pushing me through resistance to achieve my goal. But whatever energy is spent upholding that tension is energy I'm not placing in working toward my goal. Like, can you guys hear that? Does that make sense? So I've spent so much time in that first like decade of training of, okay, I'm not enough as I am, but if I really master this type of guard pass today, it will have been a worthwhile day and I'll, I will have justified my being alive today, right? But then tomorrow comes, you try a new guard pass, you fail, and it's a broken model. It doesn't work. So when we say should, like I shouldn't be pushed, I think all of us are on our own journey. And I think all of us are on a deeply spiritual journey, whatever your relationship is to that. And I think one of the things that draws us to jujitsu is we recognize this is much more than a physical pursuit. And I think anything is that. Like, I think freaking crochet could be that. It's just this happens to be the thing that we've devoted so much time and attention to. It's a really good environment. It's good soil to grow in. But we all are probably going to start by push. It's just, if you make it to the end of the line, you're not going to still 
be being pushed. You're going to be pulled because I view actually in the next book, I, I use the imagery of, if you think of like Elon Musk sending a rocket off into space, the rocket's greatest obstacle to flight is ironically the weight of the fuel it carries. So its greatest obstacle is that which is actually pushing it. And when the rocket gets off out of the atmosphere and kind of breaks that gravity point, it releases that heavy baggage because it no longer needs it. And then it smooths freely, like almost like an embodiment of like Taoist teachings. I think we do the same thing. I think you've got this fuel source that gets you started, that is actually, you think it's serving you, but it's probably your biggest impediment to progress, but it's the only thing we've known. So you hold on to it, you rock it as long as you need to. And when you're ready, if you're ready, you let it go. And I think that's when you transition to pool, if that makes sense. You, you guys are cool. I enjoy this. Thank you. Really good. Really good. Um, I saw Corey's hand up and then Jeremy will double back to you if that's okay. Uh, go for it, Corey. Hey, everybody. Hey, um, hey Chris. Uh, thanks for talking to us. Um, I am a lowly white belt and I've been training for 51 weeks, I'm one week away from my one year anniversary. So um, being past 40, I'm fairly you. proud of myself. Um, yeah. Uh, I train with my son and my youngest son trains with little kids. And so that's one of my motivations is, uh, you know, dad and son time. Uh, but I also enjoy uh, the violence of everything. And uh, um, my question for you is, uh, as I approach getting my blue belt, uh, probably in the next year, um, I've seen a lot of my classmates who have graduated to their blue belts. Uh, a lot of them seem to disappear. Um, and as I've read different things, uh, there seems to be some sort of uh, strange curse of the blue belt where uh, they either drop off for a while or permanently. Um, so I'm wondering how I can prepare myself best for making that transition and, and sticking with it and just continuing on in my journey. Dude, beautiful. You're right, right? That whole blue belt blues thing. And I've seen the exact same thing in my academy. And if your goal is blue belt and you get blue belt, you no longer have a goal. And Working toward a goal is like our greatest source of positive emotion. And for whatever reason, all of us have chosen jujitsu, which is an unbelievably difficult pursuit. And here's the freaking crazy thing, right? If you're a sincere student and you're really stretching yourself and always trying to expand and learn and grow, it's just as hard in your 15th year as it is your first year, because you're still seeking that expansion. And that expansion is no different, whether it's like in the beginning or 15 years later. There's still resistance always. So for me, I think the belts are an external representation of inner development. And if we tie the goal to the external metric, that is a push. That is not a pull, right? There's just not enough substance there. But if it's more so like a recognition and a trophy along the way, and you're pursuing something much deeper, then you'll be able to push through that. Because what why does anyone eventually quit? It's like jujitsu has served a purpose. And then for whatever reason, it stops serving that purpose. So it's, if you believe this is part of your path, and I wouldn't wish this path on anybody because it's incredibly difficult, but it's incredibly rewarding. If this is part of your path, then I would, I would invite you to understand what role it plays and develop the conscious understanding of how much bigger that is than an actual belt what it is relative to like you in your essence. And then all the belts kind of go away. Like my, uh, my professor was always, uh, you know, like we wouldn't even get stripes on our belt. It was just like, all right, when you're ready, here's a brown belt, here's a black belt. And it was so far removed from the traditional, like you're getting promoted on this day and this time and that kind of thing, that just by the nature of the environment, it couldn't be a goal because you had no idea when it was going to happen. So you had to focus on something else. But I would say to kind of sum all that up, if you know why you're training, know what it is you're getting out of this, allow yourself to be pulled through this art in a way that's aligned with your soul. And then the belts are just little like checkpoints in your calendar along the way that feel good for a day. Like I remember when I was a white belt, I would see a black belt and like deify them. It's like, oh my God, there's one of them. Like, like as a unicorn. And then I remember I was out to eat one day with like eight of my teammates and I looked around the table and we were all black belts. And I was just like, oh shit, it's not as cool as I thought it was. 
nothing changes, you know, nothing changes. But having thought that things would change, that was a good push at white belt. But if we're going to get you into week 52 and then into blue and beyond, it needs to be tied to something much deeper than the belt and probably much deeper than jujitsu. Great question, Corey. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go to Jeremy next. And then um, I want to give a chance to let those who haven't asked questions, Blake, Travis, and even Brad, uh, and then we'll double back to Steve. Uh, Jeremy. Hi, uh, thanks again for uh, meeting with us, Chris. It's uh, great to have you on. And uh, some of the things you said is just uh, really deep and really profound. And I come from a deep background. I'm an accountant by trades. So uh, this really resonates with me you know, on that deep thinking level type stuff. And that's kind of revolves around my question. I'm 45 now, and I just started about eight months ago. And I, I'm a former Marine, so we're highly competitive people by nature. And my reasons for joining jujitsu, I started back when I was in my late 20s and uh, dropped out, you know, as, uh, just so many injuries and whatnot over the years. And um, and then I had an injury again here recently, and I had, was out for about two weeks at one point, and then another two weeks for another injury, and um, from going too hard at times, I think, and, and trying to get back on the mats sooner. And uh, working with Brandon, you know, we've been working on a little bit of mindset stuff as well. And, um, you know, not being successful all the time on certain moves, I've kind of come to that realization that, dude, these guys have been training this stuff for years beyond my time on the mat so why do I need to be thinking I should be able to hit this move or that move or the vice versa you know and it's really helped a lot but what other tools would you give somebody just starting out to to propel them forward to not think just about the the minute micro macro rather than think about the micro you know and, and from that perspective yeah yeah it's great um retention is nearly everything right because we can go into a jujitsu class we can collect a bunch of data but if you don't store that data it's like you're starting over the next day so i kind of always had a rule with myself where i would get made fun of all the time uh, until people recognized that it was working like i would have a notebook and i would not leave the mat until i wrote down everything i learned and i would I'd write down everything i learned and then i would write down what questions i had what my sticking points were and then i kind of made this tacit contract with myself that before I train next, I'm going to get an answer to that question. So I just made a point to be as purposeful as possible in this pursuit of education. So I think retention, whatever it is for you, whether it's taking notes or, you know, just recording what you learn so you can listen to it or videos. I think that's really important in the beginning. And then I, I think it's also, especially dude, I love that, you know, you're back on the mat at that stage. Like that's a beautiful thing. And you're right. Injuries are an issue. I think we need to address the fact that this is a very long-term game, a, a damn near infinite game, and you're not going to figure it out in one day. So having a little bit of grace for yourself to just, I'm going to get a little bit better today. And I would tell students, like, if you get one new idea, one new tool, like I would use the metaphor of this is Home Depot, and every day you come in, your job is to make sure you leave with one more tool. And if you just do that day after day after day, you're going to get really good at jujitsu. I mean, think about it. If you train twice a week, that's 100 times a year. You have 100 new tools. You don't need 100 tools in jujitsu, right? You need like seven good ones and you're good. So I would say it's a matter of personal standards. And again, this is just what's worked for me and the people around me. I would hold myself to the standard of I'm going to get at least one new tool per day. And then... To kind of piggyback off that, if you look at things from the level of what, how, and why, I couldn't really learn anything until I understood the why and then the how. And then the what made sense because the technique is an embodiment, a manifestation of certain underlying principles. And it's those underlying principles which exist across domains into other techniques. So an effort to maximize my time on the max, we only have so much time, I would try to really understand what are the underlying principles that this technique is an expression of, that then I can understand that principle and have the eyes to see it when it pops up in other positions and other techniques. So really high standards for yourself, a commitment to getting at least one new tool per, per day, and then really seeking to understand why 
the techniques work. Because if you get the whys down, that's why teaching is so valuable. Like all the guys that start teaching in my academy, the first thing I tell them is do it for selfish reasons, because the better a teacher you become, the better a student you're going to become, because you're forced to consciously articulate the things you do in your body. And until you can put words to them, like you can't remember what you don't understand. So I would say really seek to understand. So good. That was so good. Uh, I love the concept of just taking one thing too. You know, I think that's a common mistake is people try to remember everything and then they don't yeah. remember anything, <laughs> you know, yeah. just one tool. I love it. Um, Travis, do you have any questions or Blake? I want to give you guys a chance to ask and then, um, yeah, we'll go back to Steve and Joe after that. I got one real quick. Um, I won't stick it on mindset, but let me start off. Chris, uh, really appreciate you coming out here and taking the time to speak with us. It's an honor and a pleasure. Um, my main question is going to be, I'm, I'm a fellow white belt, um, two stripe coming on my third. We lost them. I think we lost them. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Travis if you have something. And then if Blake hops back on, we'll go back. To sure. So, um, I am a blue belt, uh, at white belt. I competed, uh, three times. Uh, I went two and six, um, competing again this Saturday. And then I uh, hopefully three more times this year. Um, I compete not necessarily to be some sort of world champion. I'm 30 years old with a wife and kids. That's probably not in my future. However, I compete because it makes me so much better. And I learn so much while trying to use my game on people that don't know me and how I train. Um, the issue is, is when I do compete, uh, I get incredibly nervous beforehand, um, all the way up to even right now, it's three days out and I'm already nervous just talking about it. Um, in my daily life, I'm not a nervous person. I'm a paramedic. I work on people who are in the worst moments of their lives with no problem, no sweat, no big deal. Uh, even early in my career, I didn't have that problem. Jiu-Jitsu seems to be the only thing that when I transfer that to uh, kind of game time, I guess you could say, uh, it all starts to kind of unravel. And I was just wondering if you had some sort of mindset shift uh, ideas that I could work towards. Yeah. I mean, bro, I think anyone here would completely agree with you. Like I competed for the exact same reason. I, I needed something on the calendar to stretch me, to keep me sincere. And I would just keep pushing it out. Like what is the the long enough time horizon where I have to be my absolute best today and then just keep scheduling those out. And I did that year after year after year. Uh, I don't think I ever really enjoyed competition. Uh, even when it was going really well, I did not enjoy it. And the nerves, that's the thing I don't miss, bro. I don't envy you and I appreciate your situation like that. It's freaking Thursday and you're already thinking of, like you already feel the stress of Saturday. I don't miss that at all. But Here's, here's the gift for you that you're giving yourself. Sorry, that's my dog. Hey, 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 stop. So I would pay attention to the experience that you're feeling. One second, boys, I apologize. Fox, hey, hey, come here. Good boy. So if you pay attention to the feelings in your body, to the sensation of anxiety, is it really any different physically, physiologically than excitement? Like I'm asking you right now. No, no, it's the same sensation. Yeah, it, it's the same experience. So that's where I think a little bit of like, you know, verbal judo is really useful where, cause I would feel the exact same thing. And when your thinking mind observes your body, the thinking mind says, Fucks. The thinking mind says, oh, my God, I am so nervous. This is not going to go well. Look how sweaty my hands are. Oh, shit, this is going to be terrible. And we do that on Thursday before Saturday. But what if we just repurposed it of like, wow, that's an indication from my physiology that I find this tournament, this competing so important that 48 hours prior, my palms are already sweaty. Look how excited I am to compete in this tournament. And I would train my mind because at that point I couldn't stop the, the thinking mind, right? It was on autopilot, but I could choose what words it had to pull from. So I would just constantly over the next two days, change that conversation in your own head of look how excited I am. Look how important this must be. 
look how courageous I am to go out when I don't have to, when I have a wife and kids and a nice home, and I'm going to go fight strangers because I think it's good for my soul. And I would just change the language within your own mind. And it can really change the experience entirely. And up until like when you're warming up, like I don't miss the warm ups, right? It's like you got five minutes, you're on a hard gym floor, and it's like get warmed up before you'll fight to the death. It was terrible. But even in that, it would be like I would take a moment. This is why a mindfulness practice is so important, right? To your attention gets lost up in that river of thoughts, it never stops. But if you can pull it down to this moment, and I would just sit there and I would pay attention to the energy in my body, at how much energy was at my disposal in that moment. And I would not call it nerves. I would call it excitement. And in bringing the awareness to my body, I no longer had the awareness lost in that automaticity of thought that wasn't serving me. And then I would bring thought back in and restructure the words to become more empowering. And that is something that, bro, that that takes time. Like right now, I would call this tournament, you're getting one rep in this experience. And who knows what can happen in one rep. Dude, you may do it. You may win this weekend. It may go incredibly well. Or nothing will change. I don't know, right? We don't know. But it's one more rep at developing the awareness to restructure your relationship to that energy that exists within you, which is really like unlimited power and capacity. It's just learning to channel it in a way where it serves your goal rather than impedes your goal. And that takes time. And I would say by the very nature of you asking this question, you're already on that path. And we'll see on Saturday what step of the path you're on, you know, and then go from there. I hope that's helpful. It is. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for asking the question, Travis. I think a lot of people had that same question, so appreciate it. Uh, we're going to double back to Blake since uh, internet connections there, but yeah, Blake, take it away. Yes. Sorry about that. I actually had a phone call come in and it cut out the complete thing. So um, again, it's an honor and pleasure. I appreciate you having me on the call with us today um, and being able to pick your brain a little bit. Um, so my name is Blake. I'm out here in Eugene and I'm a two stripe white belt at the moment, uh, trying to get my next stripe working towards my blue, of course, um, trying to get to black. That's my ultimate goal. We all know once you get to black, it's white belt all over again. Right. So I um, kind of want to get to that jump ship. And my main question will be, what do you give? What's a good, um, what do you look for better said in a white belt getting closer to blue um, to be able to work on and pick? What do you guys see when you guys are looking for promotions uh, getting closer towards the blue belt level? Because we have our, professor's professor coming out in June. Um, so I kind of really want to start picking, you know, my own brain and start working at, you know, pace a thousand and just don't stop. Yeah, dude, that's a great question. So when I got my blue belt, I remember my teacher said, okay, now you're ready to learn jujitsu. And at first I was like, well, what the hell have I been doing this whole time? But you need a certain amount of critical mass, right. To understand what this is. And I think in my mind, when I think about promoting someone from white to blue belt, white belt is the foundation upon which the rest of your skill will rest. So I kind of view jujitsu like a language and it's like each technique is a word. And by the time you're a blue belt, it's like, can you put good sentences together? That's really all I'm looking for, right? Do you understand the hierarchy of positions? Can you navigate them skillfully? Are you training safely and not like a lunatic? Are you starting to understand little bits of whys and hows? And we call it rolling, right? And there's a lot of wisdom in that. If you envision a brand new white belt training, they are not rolling smoothly. It's like a violent car crash in every direction. And then as you get more experienced, if you imagine a literal ball rolling, it just flows. And I think watch a black belt train, a good black belt train, they flow from one transition to the next in a way where it all seems tied together and effortless. So one of the things I'm looking for, if you think of it on a continuum, as the, the car crash and a flowing beautiful sphere, where are you at on that continuum? And have you moved substantially away from that initial chaos? And if you can flow, and if you do understand the four major positions and you can transition between them and you're a good dude that's not hurting people, in my mind, you're a blue belt because it means you're starting to speak the language. So without knowing your academy, without knowing the criteria by which you're promoted, it would be, can you train smoothly 
effectively transitioning between the major positions? And are you a sincere student? And, and if you're doing that and starting to speak the language, I, I would say that you're a blue belt, just so you guys have a little bit more data. For me, I kind of put it at, by the time someone has taken 100 classes, they're a blue belt. You know, it, it's my responsibility to build a program that by the time you've taken 100 classes, you will have acquired the skill of a blue belt. So that's generally, depending on the individual, six months to a year, but probably more like a year. But I, I'm looking for, can you speak the language? Or are you starting to speak the language? Cool, I really appreciate it. Yeah, especially that I'm right around that ballpark anyways. I'm at my 10 month mark, getting my third stripe here any day now. So nice. I think with that time frame, with a couple months, I think it's definitely a high possibility. I train five times a week. You know, I'm at 162 classes to date. So nice. Yeah. Actually, yeah, let, let me hop in real quick because we're all in different academies with different cultures. And most people are not organized with promotions. So please do not think you're not getting promoted is a reflection of your worth as a martial artist or a person because most jujitsu school owners, we are highly unorganized people. And it's just like, oh, like, you know, it's like you put your finger up. I should promote Brandon today. You're like, that's how a lot of people do it. Like I know guys who have been, you know, they're like three, four year training four times a week and they're still white belts. You know, like it's, you're not a white belt at that point. So knowing that every school is different, hopefully they give you a little bit of the criteria and metrics by which they are promoting because the old school way was always keep training hard and your day will come. That's not helpful. That doesn't help anybody, you know? So what I actually did, because I recognized, I, I feel very grateful that one of the roles I play in life is to share jujitsu with people. And I'm, really adamant about I, I am creating a program that is going to help the average 40 something dude become a legitimate purple belt in jujitsu. So it's like, I want to be world class at creating purple belts, but I have no concern for creating world class purple belts, if that makes sense, because I want to use this as a vehicle for development. So I believe the more you pave the path, the more likely people are to walk it. So I have a uh, essentially like a checklist for the students. And this is our fundamentals curriculum. This is what we're looking for. This is what we teach. They have a card that they check off the techniques they've learned and they can see that card fill up over the first hundred classes. So they know what's expected of them. And for my understanding, that's not a very common thing. And we do a disservice to all white belts when we don't articulate the path. So in your particular academy, if the path is not articulated and you're not getting promoted, it's more likely the fault of systems and lack of organization than it is your efforts. So while these are external measures of achievement, be very careful not to tie too much validity to them because you may be doing that in the environment of someone that's not even thinking about promotions. Like that, that's a real reality for a lot of people. Awesome. Um, want to be respectful of your time, Chris. We got about five minutes left. Um, Joe, I know you had a question, and then I think Steve, you raised your hand for a second too. Yeah. Um, maybe do you guys mind asking your question at the same time, and maybe Chris can answer it all at one time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll we'll do it at the exact same time, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you kind of went over it a little bit. Um, I just had a question that I asked a little earlier. Uh, I didn't raise my hand, but I said, um, when you have hard days at the gym, injuries, et cetera, what do you do like to kind of better yourself, like mentally, physically, emotionally? That was kind of my question, but you kind of answered it. So. And then, and then Chris, my question was really uh, on the same lines. I think the team will benefit here on your concept of opposing attacks and possibly if you could kind of share that with the team and then also maybe perhaps give an example of that. Great. All right. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's do both of those. So you probably, uh, who here watches, uh, John Danaher instructionals. Yeah. Right. That dude is a freaking billionaire by now. So rightfully so he's a gift to us all. He will call it a dilemma where you want to have two opposing attacks where essentially it's like a Y in the road and your partner has to take one of those paths and you've got something waiting for them. So any technique in which you find success on a repeated basis, I would really encourage you to think, okay, what is the opposite of this technique? For example, if you have a really good sweep where you're sweeping people backwards, 
you know it's going to fail when they're coming forwards. So if I'm repeatedly succeeding in sweeping people straight back, I would want to pair it with a sweep over my head so that when they defend the sweep going backwards, they're coming into the sweep going over my head. And it exists like on a pole. And what I would try to do is create as many of those poles, those continuums as possible. So wherever you were going, I had a technique waiting for you there and it's opposite. That's something that you acquire with mat time as you get more and more tools. But if you begin with that end in mind, knowing that that's what you're ultimately going to do, you will fast track your progress. Um, so I, I hope that's clear. You can do that everywhere. And you do do it everywhere. You just don't realize you do it. Um, it's probably easiest to understand if you think of playing guard and just think about off-balancing somebody. When you off-balance somebody in any direction, they oppose that direction and they're going in its opposite. So have something else waiting there. And then to your point of uh, when we get injured, what do we do? Um, I believe that the quality of our lives is generally the quality of the worst part of our lives. So we began with Carl Jung. We can end with Carl Jung. He believed in this archetype of wholeness that we think we're pursuing perfection, but what we're really pursuing is this experience of wholeness, which is unique to all of us. So when I look at like my life, I want to make sure that I am well as an individual. I need to be fulfilling the role of husband. We don't have kids yet, but we have two dogs. So I need to be the role of a good dog owner. I need to play the role of a jiu-jitsu athlete, a jiu-jitsu coach, a mindset coach, a writer. I have my own health to attend to, my own learning to attend to, my relationship to nature. So right there is like nine things. I view them as bank accounts. And in the aggregate, over a couple of weeks, I better be depositing into every single one of those bank accounts. They all better be trending up. Because if any one of them hits bottom and goes bankrupt, my life's going to suck. So I would encourage all of us, it's probably a really good way to close. Jiu-Jitsu is one of those bank accounts, but you guys have a lot of other bank accounts. And Jiu-Jitsu is meant to be like a support system for all those other bank accounts and not the other way around. So I would just encourage all of us to, yeah, when you get injured, good, right? We'll use Jocko, good. Now you can devote time to your marriage where you've probably been neglecting it anyway. You know, so I would just deposit into the accounts when you can. And if jujitsu forces you to no longer deposit into the jujitsu account, take that energy and wisdom and place it somewhere else. So good. Awesome. So good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, man, again, I got so much out of this. I'm going to have to go back and watch the recording. This is, this is amazing. Uh, by show of hands, guys, who got something out of today, who enjoyed today's call? Yeah, awesome. Chris, thank you so much again, brother, just for graciously offering your time and your wisdom to us. Um, yeah, guys, follow him on Instagram. Um, is at Chris Matakis BJJ, right? Yep. Yeah, and then, um, guys, if you guys haven't already, yeah, I mean, I got his uh, white, bird white belt journal. I bought it more for me to evaluate it for my students. And then, man, this book right here is fire. I'm going to be buying probably all 12 of your books uh, very soon. I usually just buy one at a time. Sorry, but <laughs> I need to actually finish it and then I'll get the, get the next one. But yeah, super excited to continue to um, invest in, in uh, your resources, Chris. And yeah, I would encourage you guys to do the same. Uh, how can they get this on Amazon? Is there any other way that you'd want us to direct them to or? Uh, appreciate it. Amazon is great. Yep. If yeah. you type in my name in Amazon, you'll see all the books and I deeply appreciate all the support and I'll kind of close with, I don't think that any of us can do anything for the world other than work on ourselves mm -hmm. and who you become becomes the gift you give the people around you. And at a time right now where the world can use as much good as possible, just keep lovingly working on yourself and everyone around you will benefit. So I appreciate the sincerity that you all have on all of your paths and uh, I wish you the absolute best. Yeah, well, guys, thank you so much again for hopping on today. I appreciate all of your time. Again, thank you so much, Chris. You guys have a beautiful day, and we'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks for coming on, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Bye, guys. Have a good one, Chris. Bye. Have a good day.